My name is Tim Ruiz, and I take care of Constitution Hall. And uh, thank you all for coming out today. This is the uh, 19th annual uh, Bleeding Kansas Lecture Series. And I want to thank you for your patronage and your support for this program series. And we've got uh, six programs this year. And they're all fine programs. And we're going to start on the high note today, talking about our grand state capital of Topeka. Of course, the room that you're sitting in, this is where it all began. A hundred and this year, 159 years ago. Uh, this building was built in 1856. And I always think, and some of you that, are, that have come to these uh, programs through the years, you always hear me say this, but this building, particularly for programs, historians, authors, they're talking about events in this very room that were discussed, you know, 150 plus years ago. This building has a lot of historical mystique, and... Uh, what we lack in modern convenience for programs is more to make up for its, the historical value of this building. So, Constitution Hall is a survivor. It's been here 159 years. And I want to thank you all for coming out here today. Uh, also, um, we've got books that were published by the State Historical Society on the Capitol Restoration. If you're interested, they're downstairs. Maybe a uh, very might even uh, sign those, possibly. <laughs> but anyway, um, this is where it began in 1856 when the territorial legislature. This was the capital of Kansas, rather humble beginnings. And then now we have in Topeka this grand, beautiful uh, structure that is our state capital. And uh, so thank you for coming out today. And um, I'm going to step aside because I know you didn't come out here today to listen to me talk. And I'm going to, uh, well, before I do that, I need to recognize a few people. I always forget this. If you're enjoying the coffee and the cookies and refreshments, you can thank Vicki Lechner and Charlene Winter and Iona Spencer and whomever else brought those. So how about giving those a little Also, I wanted to recognize uh, a couple of people in the audience. Uh, where is our mayor at? Sandy Jocko, would you please stand? This is Sandy Jocko, mayor of Lacombe. <laughs> and also, we have uh, Senator Anthony Hensley here today. And I asked uh, Senator Hensley if he would like to do the introduction for our speaker today, uh, Barry Grice. But before I do that, hand it over to you, uh, Senator. I'd like for Paul Bonmar to come up and introduce uh, Senator Hensley. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's always an honor and pleasure to have Senator Anthony Hensley here. He's been a friend of of this national landmark and historic site for, for many years and has always uh, been to Lecompton on a number of times and we're lucky to have him as one of our state senators. We have two state senators, believe it or not, in Lecompton, Senator Marcy Francisco and Senator Hensley, and then our state representative is Tom Sloan. So we've got three friends in the legislature and we're real lucky to have them and with that we will welcome you, Senator Hensley. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to introduce uh, somebody that I served with uh, many years ago in the Kansas House of Representatives. Actually, it was 40 pounds ago. <laughs> John Solbach, former state representative. <laughs> Governor Brownback, uh, in his last, yeah, last year's State of State message, said uh, the good news is the crane is gone. <laughs> And uh, the crane was there for quite a, quite a while. This project lasted longer than what we originally anticipated. It lasted 15 years. 
But through it all, the guy that kept the faith was Barry Grice, uh, the state house historian. If it wasn't work for him, uh, I'm not sure that the many legislators would have been willing to uh, see this thing through. Uh, through his perseverance and his dedication, um, it is now a glorious project. Uh, have, how many of you have been to the Visitor Center? Yeah, it's, it's fantastic, the addition has been there. And we now have a kiosk system, which I was up there earlier today and had a chance to kind of work my way through that. It's very interesting. Um, I will make one suggestion on how uh, to get directions to my office, so I'll tell you about All that right. later. <laughs> <laughs> there is an elevator much closer to my office than the one that they're being directed to go to. So, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, Barry and his wife are very important people because they're residents of the 19th Senatorial District, the district that I represent. So I always like to introduce VIPs. And in my opinion, Barry Grice is one of the truly great Kansans. He will go down in history as one of the truly great Kansans because of his accomplishment as the State House architect and uh, the finishing product that we have with this preservation project. So, without any further delay, I'd like to introduce the State House architect, Barry Grice. Thank you. It's nice to be here at La Compton. Show you a brief presentation of what we started back in 1866. So in 1866, we started with the State House planning. And much like what we're going to do as we get closer and started on the renovation. But in 1866, there were a couple plans that were put forth and Matt Veach, from the state archivist, he's here again, and we'll speak more about that later. But you have Mr. Mix's plan here to my right, which was probably a three, four-story building. And it was not selected. As you know, John Haskell's design was selected. He had a four-story building, which then became a five-story building. And they changed the dome uh, later on. But when we started, you had the original design of Mr. Mix, and then it went to Mr. Haskell. Uh, it was completed in four phases, the east wing, then the west wing, uh, the south wing, the north wing, and the rotunda. Even though they were all built at the same time, it was considered uh, multiple phases. So these are some of the first photographs. And you can see the chimneys on the top of the east wing uh, because of the fireplaces. Uh, when the west wing was built on the lower left there, uh, they connected it between the east and the west wings with a tunnel made of wood and uh, it was so loud when the winds blew through Kansas uh, that some people didn't even want to walk through it. Uh, then you reach the north and the south wing and the uh, rotunda coming up out of the ground there. So, 67 years late, 37 years later, it was finished in 1903. And during that time, there were nine deaths that occurred uh, during construction. I wasn't even aware of that um, until just last year. I assumed there were a couple. But nine's a, a lot of people uh, that were lost during that. So in 1903, the vision was completed. We had the state house. You notice the, the trees, the bobby pop trees that surround the driveway. Uh, we tried to capture that in, in today's work. But to get into it, we had to look at the, and create a historic structures report. We wanted to know what was in the building, what incursions had been made over the years that we wanted to get rid of. We had pop machines in the hallways, file cabinets in the hallways that rusted and stained the beautiful uh, granite floors and marble floors. Uh, so, we did research, they looked at uh, old drawings, things like that, and these are some of the photographs of what we started with. Uh, an eight foot, nine foot ceiling, you see the drop ceiling there, and it was covering up uh, four foot of ceiling above that. And that's what, we, that's what we were so surprised at, but when they put in the heating and air conditioning system, 
uh, they had to lower the ceiling because that's how they solved it with their large ductwork. It had to run horizontal. We changed that and ran vertical. Uh, the architects, uh, trainer architects, also looked at uh, historic drawings naturally. We had over 200 uh, photographs and drawings that they looked at and put in a book to help define what improvements needed to be made. Uh, here, the old Senate chamber, uh, after it was remodeled in 1885, uh, duct system to take the air up out of the circular, down here, uh, the circular <coughs> takes go up through the copper fluted <coughs> columns and out through the, the roof. And it was a natural air circulation system. So they were non-structural, they were highly decorative. And we looked at what could we find that were historic documents that were look like. This is the state treasurer's office. And it's, it's not necessarily easy to see, but in the background, back up there, huge stencils. Now this is the west wing. And we had huge stencils, 30 inches in height, that surrounded the room and was painted in greens and yellows. Uh, well, we didn't have photographs in color back then, so we don't know what it was until we took down a huge ductwork system, vertical duct, took it off the wall, and behind it was an unfinished, original stained wall, painted wall, floor to ceiling. So we got to see all the original colors that had been covered up for 50 years. So we found exciting things like that as we went through it. Now we get to our, our preservation and uh, restoration. So we had a historic structures report done by trainer architects. Uh, we had about six architectural firms, um, and some of them were collaborating with architects in Kansas from uh, half a dozen different states. Uh, trainer architects out of Lawrence and then uh, moving to Topeka and opening an office here. They were selected. And they were also selected to do the design work as we moved forward. And then we hired Jade on construction. Well, we had, uh, again, a national interest, and a half dozen different states had uh, construction managers that wanted to do this project. Uh, Jade Dunn out of Kansas City, Missouri, uh, was selected. And so they've been with us throughout the whole project. And we really got started in about 1997, there was the Capital Restoration Commission that was appointed by the legislature. Now, since then, until now, there's been about 28 different leaders that we've had to work with over all those years. So, the leadership has constantly changed, except for one person who was here the entire time, and that was our Senate Minority Leader, Senator Hensley. <laughs> four governors, uh, countless secretary of administrations uh, to get here, but we did. So after the historic structures report, we had the vision. We needed to know what the architects wanted to do for the project. And I was responsible for uh, going to the legislature and representing them. 70% of my time was working for the legislative branch. 30% was executive branch time for the construction process. And I was responsible for seeing the scope of work, the quality of work, the budget, and the schedule. All kind of controversial things, <laughs> as you know as we move forward. Uh, but it was a, a good job because the architects were very creative. They looked at the ground floor, the basement, and said maybe we could create uh, skylit corridors and expose the natural stone and move offices down there. And the legislature liked that. Why? Well, we wanted to expand the building. We wanted to have better committee rooms so that visitors could come and sit and be part of the committee process. Uh, they could come and testify more and become more involved in state government. Uh, but we also wanted to improve the quality of the offices of the elected officials so that they could do their work better. We wanted to make it a 21st century modern office building. So we had to include new infrastructure. We wanted to put in uh, Cat5 cabling, uh, copper wires that were ready for fiber optics. So all our raceways are all in conduit and easily removable if 
the next generation is fiber optics. Uh, we needed to do that. So all new heating and air conditioning systems, all new electrical. Uh, so we have new plumbing. To meet ADA requirements, we have all new restrooms. Every one of our restrooms are accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, new carpeting, new furniture, new paint. Ah, but what about all those stencils that you'll see? Things like that. Everything that you see in the historic building are the original colors, the original stencils that we found. We took exposure strips and uh, exposed the paint on the wall and stripped it down layer by layer until we could get to the original paint a hundred years ago. We sent it out to the laboratory to confirm the colors. And then there's the months old color charts, the universal color charts that we used to match it up so that we could reproduce those colors and that they could be made from here on. And we can go to Sherwin Williams or anybody else and they can recreate the formulas. So everything that you see is what they chose. Your forefathers back in the 1800s there's only two colors in there that I changed. One was a fluorescent green, which I didn't know where it came from. It was just a small stripe uh, in the temporary governor's office. And I changed that to darken up because they couldn't guarantee that that was part of the original. Uh, but everything else, it's there. So, not only did we have the Skyway corridors, but we tried to improve on the private offices of the elected officials. So this would be like a temporary uh, senator's suite, two private offices, or uh, representatives. And uh, these exist today. We don't have the roll top desks. We didn't build in those things. But this was to give you the impression of what could be. Now, after the historic structures report is done, we presented the vision to the Capital Restoration Commission. They approved the design, and then we went back to them and said, would you like an underground parking garage? Because that wasn't in the plan. And they thought about it, and in a very short time, they said yes. So we came up with the plans. It's a 551-car, two-story underground parking garage. Here's over one <coughs> Visitor stalls and 14 accessible van stalls. So every one of our stalls are, uh, can be used by a van. Uh, plus our head height. Is, I, I mention this because it's 8 foot 2 inches. Uh, that's the minimum for an ADA van. Well, we've got it throughout the entire garage. So you can be on the upper R or the lower level. Uh, lower level is reserved for legislators, elected officials, and staff. This is a section through the State House showing the two-story underground parking garage. And you can see it's kind of away from the building. It's actually 40 feet away from the uh, historic structure uh, because we didn't want to build it attached to it. In case there was an accident, it wouldn't affect our historic structure. <coughs> now, to get there, to do this renovation, we had to look at all the utilities. We've got electrical and sewer lines, and they crisscross throughout uh, the grounds. Uh, the electrical, the sanitary and storm sewers went out to the north to 8th Street. And that's where we were going to put our parking garage underneath of that. Plus, we had steam lines that go from the docking state office building. We have, call that the heating plant. It provides the air conditioning, the chilled water, and the steam for the State House. It also goes through the State House and goes over to Landon State Office, to Memorial Hall, Curtis, and then the Kansas Judicial Center. We had to reroute those things. So to do that, we moved the storm sewer and the sanitary out of the way. We put in a $1 million new electrical system. Ours was so outdated it couldn't have handled any of the new structures, so working with Westar Energy, uh, they rerouted it down 8th Street, down Harrison Street, and came in the side of the building. Well, that all sounds really good, and we did that. And by making these changes, we removed a lot of the insulation that's on the inside. All the low uh, sanitary lines, electrical, uh, sprinkler system, power lines uh, that covered the ceiling. When you look at this drawing, see those four boxes, or five boxes? Those are just banker's boxes. Well, that was a little under five feet to walk through that tunnel. See, everybody that walked through it 
uh, had to bend over, and that was throughout the state house. And we had to change that. We had to make changes and, and move some of these utilities outside the building. So how did we do that? Well, you've got the historic building that's outlined in red, and it's not as easy to see, but uh, on the outside of that are four mechanical vaults in each one of the quadrants. And that's where our mechanical systems went. And we put them out there. To the north, at the top of the, the picture, is the visitor center. And that's on the ground floor. You're looking at the, the basement floor. We ended up increasing the space by about 118,000 square feet. And so we went from a building that had like 367,000 square feet. We're now at 495,000 square feet gross square footage. It's a huge building. This is just a section through the building showing the uh, additions of the mechanical vaults in yellow. And that's where our mechanical systems are. And the blue areas represent the expanded office space and the Skylet corridors, and those are on all four sides of the building. We had to do it in phases. So we actually accepted the same uh, method that they used when they did the east wing and the west wing. We did the same thing. Uh, first, the yellow was the infrastructure. That's the parking garage and the four mechanical vaults. And then we started with the dark green, the east wing, moved to the purple, which was the west wing, and then the south wing, the north wing, and the rotunda. We did it in those four phases, but we had to constantly move people about. I did have one Senate president who moved three times. And every time I see Senator Kerr, he sometimes mentions it. <laughs> he moved more than others. <laughs> Because one of the requirements of the leadership was that they had to have both chambers fully operational for every session. So from January to essentially May, uh, we couldn't do any construction work in those areas. Well, that means we really started up the 1st of June, and we had to finish sometime in December with our construction because we had to board everything up, lock it down, and be ready for the session that starts in January. Uh, so we had these short windows every year. And we had an eight-year project, as Senator Hensley said. Uh, that's what we started out with. When we got the parking garage, we extended that. Uh, when they said that they had to stay in the building the whole time, that didn't change the schedule. But when we build things, uh, when I talk about phases, you can see the yellow, the garage over there. Then the, to the right is the darker blue. Well, that was the south wing. But you notice on the first floor, the south wing goes into the rotunda because we can never make a clean cut of the work areas. We had to let circulation uh, drive part of the project. We had to make sure people could get from one side, the east side, Senate chamber, to the west side, to the house chamber. They had to always be accessible and get to the governor's office. So we constantly set up sheetrock wall, which many of you have seen over the years, and they stayed up a long time. And this, it shows that we're diverting people to the right, going through our, our corridors, and on the left, that was a door that went into the rotunda, because that was a construction zone at that time. When we started digging, we needed to put the infrastructure in first, like I said. In order to move the electrical system, we had to build this first northwest quadrant underground so that we could get our electrical lines in here, our new substation, our, our new switch gear uh, from West Star bef before we could abandon the other lines. And this shows how far we went down. We put up a lagging wall to the right of beams and timbers that are still there. The dirt. Uh, between the lagging wall there, made up of timbers, and the historic wall, uh, the soil started moving on us. And at one point, it <coughs> shifted, and it made a loud noise. And I don't want to go into that any further. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to stabilize the soil. And we drilled down on a three-foot grid and put a slurry mix in there. 
And it, so it just was loose enough that it filled all the voids and stabilized the soil. We did that in all four quadrants. And needless to say, the building hasn't shifted a sixteenth of an inch. Except when the sun comes out. Because that's a living building. When the sun comes out, it grows and shrinks daily during the summer because it cools off at night. During the day, it'll actually physically expand. Because we were tracking it because of our event I'm not talking about. Uh, we measured the conditions daily for months. And our land surveyors went out and surveyed it. How did the building change? And at the beginning, we were doing it multiple times during the day. And that's when you can verify that the building moves. So interesting thing. When we, when we finish that northeast quadrant, we put a lid on it, seal it off, and put dirt over that. Here, the white top areas are the fresh air intakes and exhaust areas from a heating and cooling system. Uh, they project through. Uh, and so we only have two or three feet of soil under, uh, above this roof in these quadrants, but it's enough to grow things so that we have small trees, <coughs> a lot of shrubs and plants, and we can landscape the areas quite well. And down below, well, here's our mechanical vault. Now, it's empty at this time, but that's what it looks like. It's a two-story mechanical vault for all our heating and cooling systems. We have our electrical switch gear in one vault. We have our uh, fire protection system, red pumps, jockey pumps in another vault. We call them vaults. And uh, the other one is uh, typical of our, of our uh, mechanical equipment our heating and air conditioning. And we have to change the filters just like you do at your house. If you look at the door there with two windows, one window and then another one above, it's 14 feet tall. So when we change our filters, we actually walk in there and replace 20 or 30 filters at a time. But it's similar to what you have to do. Then we look back at uh, our parking. There's our, there's our parking garage. To start, we had to dig the hole. Well, we had always heard that there was an underground river. It was in the paper. And uh, everybody knew it was there. Well, we drilled 58 holes around the perimeter of the original state house and looked for the water table. And we knew from the very beginning, before we started construction, that there was no river. It never has been. <laughs> what we have are limestone layers throughout Kansas, and those limestone layers have lenses in between the two different layers of limestone is a lens, and that's where the water travels. And so we've had water traveling from the south to the north to the river uh, all the time. And that's what we encountered. We encountered this water. So we had to protect against that. So first we dug our two holes, and you see the red dots in the middle there? That's our original electrical lines that we had to keep operational until the Northwest Vault was built and Westar could connect. So they had two holes that they had to access in order to continue building. <coughs> and that was interesting of itself. Uh, we did get water down in the west area, uh, and I was tempted to put a small boat <laughs> let it float when the wind got it. Uh, because the newspaper article back at the turn of the century, or in the 1800s, said that you could see the white caps because the wind was blowing. So <laughs> but I figured I would do that on my last day. <laughs> so I decided to stick around and not play with boats. So we, we started our construction. And now this is the north wing. What you're seeing here is the north historic building, and there's one thing that's missing. That's the grand staircase. We had to dismantle the grand staircase in order to put in our new one to build a visitor center and connect it to the parking garage. Well, this is the third time. It's already been replaced two times before that, and we don't know why. We didn't see the documents that said why. We, we assumed it wasn't stable because when we uncovered and excavated it out, we found about 125 uh, cottonwood quarried stones that were huge. And they're now sitting out at the Historical Society. <laughs> I had to put them somewhere. And we did that on the weekend. I think. <laughs> so, 
solid bedrock. We went down 40 feet with our parking garage to solid bedrock. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? By cottonwood, you mean the cottonwood limestone formation, not the tree? Yes, the cottonwood <laughs> limestone. Yes, sir. You know, and I didn't start out this way, and I had told Matt that I would, that I, I would ans answer any questions as we went through it, because you may want to know something way back when. So if you do have a question, don't hesitate about asking me now. <coughs> because I might forget to ask you later. <laughs> Can I add a couple of things? Yes, sir. Two things. One thing I would add, the parking garage has been great in alleviating the parking congestion during the session in the downtown Topeka area. Um, you know, and that, that has been, John can tell you, a historic problem we've had over the years between the Topeka delegation and other legislators. Uh, and then the other thing I would add, there, there was a uh, time when the Senate in 05 had to meet in the old Supreme Court room rather than our chamber because we had a special session that took place for, I believe, about 12 days. So we actually did, we could not get into our own chamber, so we used the old Supreme Court room, which was very interesting. Logistic. Yes, it was. And, it was, and there was a great photograph, too, of uh, the Senate convening in the old Supreme Court. Uh, finishing out the garage, you can see that this, this shot is from 8th Street and shows the different layers of the parking garage and the ramp going down when it's finished. And this is the elevator area, the lobby, in the parking garage that you all can access on either floor. Well, you can't unless you have a key card access to, get to the lower floor, but uh, on the visitor floor, it looks the same. And the architects had come up with a future visitor's entrance uh, drawing at the very beginning, so they had this rendering done. Well, when the garage was done, here's, our, here's what it looks like, and it's pretty darn close. Now, what you see is the gray concrete that's exposed because we had always planned to put uh, cottonwood limestone veneer on it, uh, which we have done. But it paralleled so closely what the vision was. Now, if we go inside and we started with the east wing to make those renovations, we did come up with a couple surprises. One, we found a cistern in the east wing of the revisor's office at the far end of the east wing, and it was collecting water from the outside that came inside. <laughs> Why did we bring water inside? I don't know. Uh, but there it is. It's a brick-lined cistern. Uh, we called out uh, the historical society. They came out and they probed it because it was moist. Uh, there's a ladder there, but the ground was moist, and they took a six-foot rod and could go all the way through it because it was moist. So we didn't dig down. We didn't excavate it. Uh, we were on a shorter scale, and we had to keep moving, but it's there. It's there for somebody else because all we did was put a slurry on top and cover it with a concrete slab. So it still remains. Other things we found, in the lower photograph, it's dark, that's because it's the soot from the coal. Uh, we've got photographs of the horses, the team of horses backing up uh, to our coal chute on the south side of the east wing and dumping coal in. Well, that soot remained, and we had to blast that off, and we used baking soda. So everybody talks about sand blasting, and that's the, the traditional, where you can't do that and not harm the materials, whether it's brick or masonry of a, of a granite or a limestone. Uh, so we tried different things. We tried <coughs> corn cob, we tried uh, two types of that, and we tried dry ice. The dry ice was interesting. We shot dry ice at it, and it hit the wall and melted, so it grabbed some of the dust and took the dust down to the floor and created a puddle except it wasn't as effective as the baking soda. So we went with the baking soda and blasted everything, and we had a time with that, and I don't want to get into that either, because we, we brought a lot of dust up into the state house. Uh, we could not seal it because the building hadn't been sealed, and there were so many small areas that we took high pressure and blasted the walls with baking soda, 
that the air was forced up into the uh, first floor. It went up air shafts and came out in the upper floors, all out into the rotunda. And, uh, I'm pretty sure I was gone there. <laughs> so the, the last photograph, that's just an original archway stone, but you'll notice on the left side there, it's not sitting on anything because at some time, somebody took out those stones. Now, that archway didn't fail. It compensated by this, the uh, load on it being uh, moved over to the other areas. So no, no harm, no foul. But we found things like that throughout the project. We were surprised at some of the, the things that we found. Why would someone do that? Take, take the stone out. Well, I'm assuming that they wanted to put something through it, whether it was a sewer line and they decided to put it through part of the archway there. I, I don't know. Uh, in the east wing, again, we're still in the east wing, in the attic above the portico. So we're outside the original building. We're above the steps where the colonnade is. And you look up there, and here was this wooden beam. It's a huge beam. It's about the 8 by 16 wooden beam that goes across. The photograph isn't good enough because it was 8 inches short. It never reached the other side. And that's how they originally built it. And what they did is they took uh, like a 4 by 8 and propped it up underneath of it, holding it up here all the way down to the floor. And that's how it was for a hundred years. I mean, that's, that, that was it. We thought, even though it had historic properties, that we would change it. <laughs> so we put a steel beam underneath it to some But it's fascinating. Now, why would you do that? Why would you not go back immediately and solve that? But it was just an eight-inch gap. We were short. <laughs> so, and then here is, this is a typical inside of the office space, the lowered ceilings, the heating and air conditioning cabinet underneath the window. That's where your air conditioning came up through the floors and, and from the ceiling below. We used all the Herman Miller products in 1979. We were one of the largest buyers of Herman Miller products and created offices, but they, they really weren't. We created bullpens, they called them. Senate had a bullpen. And some were six people in one space for an elected official. And that's what they work with. Now, as compared to olden times, that was still good. Uh, but it's not where we wanted to be as we move forward. Now, if you look above the ceiling system, here you can see that there's four or five feet above our lay-in ceiling. And that's where the ductwork was. But when they put it in and they had pipes running, they went right through the crown moldings and just took hatchets, chop away at so they could get their duct work up there. And, uh, but this was hidden. If you look at photographs from the state library, what you saw there, we had pipes going up and duct work that wasn't hidden. You can see where they took their axes and chopped off all the crown molding and left it there. So for 50 years, the state library had all this exposed pipe and, uh, and damage that was done to our, our ceiling system. It was fascinating. Uh, but we had to create a full-scale model of our heating and cooling system. Now, over here on the right, uh, that's our high-pressure uh, duct, duct work that's coming from those mechanical vaults. And they fed the basement first and second floor. The attic heating air cooling <coughs> systems fed the fifth, fourth, and third. So if we're going to come up from the basement and feed up or come down, will it fit in our mechanical closets that we were going to create between these two private offices? So we did full-scale mock-ups, made minor adjustments, and it has worked quite successfully. Uh, as we moved along, here on the walls, uh, you can see where we had to channel in and put in conduit. And that was done because we didn't want to expose the conduit. Uh, everything is, is there, so we can pull any kind of wires we want, but the conduit will be there now forever. We're not going to have to replaster that wall. Now, in the coffered ceiling, this is a beam in the coffered ceiling above all the floors. 
And that orange pipe there, that's part of our fire protection. That's our sprinkler line. And so we used this open space that was non-structural, because it, after all it's decorative, and we were able to feed in our sprinkler lines to go in there. Now what we found was that people also used that as a trash area. <laughs> While it was under construction on the fourth floor, and they hadn't finished the coffers, someone threw trash into it. And so they left papers. And there were small letters, there were business cards, uh, there were torn letters that you would tear up and throw in your trash can. But maybe this was a quick, quick way to do it. You didn't have to walk so far. So we actually have some of those that have been in there, and they're dated in the 1890s. Uh, these, these little things. And uh, so they, they kind of remain with us. Uh, this is examples of more channeling that we had to do. On the far right here, this large space here, that's part of our smoke management system. Uh, in order to protect you when you're in it and all of our visitors, uh, we have to get the smoke out. Remember, it's smoke kills, not the fire. And so if there were a fire, uh, the alarms would go off. Now, we never had alarms. Our fire notification system was a bullhorn. Capitol Police would go out on the first floor of the rotunda with their bullhorn and hold it up and tell everybody to evacuate the building. And they would run up five floors and go door to door to make sure that you got out. That was our fire alarm system. So now we have a fully active uh, voice alarm system that has pre-recorded and uh, uh, non-recorded messages that we can give out. Uh, we have a full fire protection system where sprinkler will be throughout. We have a VESDA detection system that detects the chemicals in the air that produce smoke before the fire uh, can be seen. So the, the chemicals are already forming as it's combusting, and the VESDA picks it up. And it reverses the fans, so we pump in fresh air, come out through these huge uh, grills that are on every floor in the rotunda, the surrounding uh, walkways of the rotunda, to push the air out to keep it flowing. Uh, on the floors, uh, one on the right is that you've got the basement showing the conduits that had to be laid. Yeah, miles and miles of conduit. On the left, we had to take up the marble floor on the upper floors and cut through the grout, lay the conduit, then put the marble back on top. Structurally, it was a, a non-issue. We got to do that just fine. But that is done throughout the state house, so moving the marble. On the left here is our old electrical switch here, and on the right is just another uh, hodgepodge of valves and lines and everything else that was in our mechanical system. The state house had major uh, skylights at the north and south wings, and they had been painted over for scores of years. Well, we opened up those skylights because we wanted to restore them. But before that, we used that to bring down our heating and air conditioning system into the attic. And so on the right, this is a crane that's lifting a part of our air conditioning system down uh, into the attics. And so we were able to do that quite effectively. To finish out our work, we had to have craftsmen from all over. And they're out there, whether they're stonemasons or plasters or painters. Here we've got plasters making repairs to our crown molding. Uh, I think it was in the west wing, they didn't have enough plasters, and we had a major problem. And we actually flew in uh, a Lithuanian couple that made the molds. So they made the uh, plaster molds that went up for the crown molding and everything else. And it was just fun to have people come in from, from all over to be involved in this project. Uh, the Senate chamber, well, here's our red carpet and the before look. Uh, this doesn't show everything, but there were 17 chandeliers in the Senate chamber. Originally, there were five. We wanted to go back to the five. <laughs> so we did. And you have to be there in the chamber to imagine 17 of these. But they were real. They were ugly. They looked like they were made by a car body shop. <laughs> In my opinion, they, they, they weren't my favorite. 
Uh, but what we did, we restored the Senate chamber similar to the House. I'll get to the House next. But we found the gold leaf. We found all the colors and all the stencils. I always tell people that that ceiling was one color at one time. It was just completely painted over. And now this is taking it back to, you know, the way it used to be. So I've actually had senators, uh, one senator came up to me and said, Harry, when did you have the time to do all this plaster work? Because it was all one color. There was no three dimension. They didn't realize all of that was there. And it's all non-structural. It's all decorative. So it's all fake, but it's beautiful. And it's being held up by a ceiling. Uh, structural system that's in the attic. And there's our Senate chamber. And the, uh oh, uh, our before and after. <laughs> but here's the, the visitor gallery. On the left, that was before that we had theater type seats. And now we went back to benches, we made it ADA accessible, we can handle four wheelchairs plus companions, similar to what we did in the house. The house chamber. Here's one of our early photographs of the house chamber. They had five chandeliers and always did. Uh, so we stayed with the five, but you can see the wood chairs. And this was the before, the dark blue carpeting. And you see the voting boards? There's the, there's the old voting boards. Well, notice these areas. These were just plaster walls. Originally, those were viewing areas, the heavy draped carpets, or carpets drapes that came down and they were private viewing areas. Uh, so that's the before and the after. Uh, and in, this really was at the beginning of the renovation. So this work was done in 1998 uh, because the paint was coming off the ceiling and falling, falling on the heads of elected officials. They noticed, they, they commented on it. They gave us the money to scaffold up the entire area to go up there. Once they did, because the ceiling was all painted white, that's when they rediscovered the murals. Mm -hmm. The historic murals that have always been there, but have been covered over for, again, scores of years. We don't even know when they were painted over. But the legislature said yes, gave us almost five, uh, $500,000 to complete this. And so that's when, in the house chamber, they discovered the stencil work, the cove molding, the ten names on the side of the wall, the first territorial governor, the first governor of the state, John Brown, uh, Colonel Lane from the Civil War, who then became U.S. Senator Lane, whose great, 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 I'm not sure, nephew, Harold Lane, uh, is in the House and has been for several years as a representative from Topeka. So here we went to our, our after. Uh, we have the Scaiola columns in the visitor's uh, center. That's one of the oldest Roman means of decoration. And it's just beautiful. Uh, all we had to do was rub it. You just rub off the old paint and then polish. Well, not we, I didn't actually. <laughs> I pointed a lot. <laughs> but they just hand polished it back. And this is the original color of uh, marble dust and blue plaster of Paris, because it's non-structural, highly decorative columns. And back to our today's house chamber, and the voting boards are gone, and they're in the, the corner with, with LED lights of all 125 names. And so you can see all 125 names on each, each side, so no matter where you're at. The desks were um, made at the Highland Mill shop, which is at 21st in Pennsylvania about five blocks from where I live there in Topeka. So it was great to use those local carpenters. Yes, great. Did beautiful work. Uh, the old Supreme Court and our Supreme Court of today. Again, the old, we had carpeting up in the soffits. I did that. I put carpet up there for sound attenuation. And it actually worked well, but when you're restoring a building, you don't want carpet up there. So when we stripped it off, that's when we rediscovered the stencils and the colors. And we went from the before, the dark black, brown, uh, copper that's in the rotunda, to the right. 
we added the chandelier and, the, and polished the carpet, the, the copper. To get that, we had to have this uh, scaffolding built from the first floor all the way up to the what we call the acorn at the very top. And to do that, we got up there and actually touched, and this is another part of where I didn't do any polishing, but it was hand polished, it was just cleaned. And then they took uh, a highlight stain and were able to highlight areas to create more three-dimensional, and then they put a clear lacquer on it to protect it. And uh, so it won't be, uh, no repairs to it for 30 or 40 years. But it turned out spectacular. And that chandelier is what it used to look like in 1942 or 44. It was removed. Uh, part of the article said it's a structural issue, but the other part says it probably was part of the war effort because it was brass and bronze and it was turned over. And I talk about egress, we did fire modeling. Digitally, we could take and create a fire anywhere in space, on the floor, on a bench here, and we could start a fire electronically because we had to make sure we had enough time to get the people from the fifth floor out of the building. So how much air did we pump in there? How fast could, to, could we get them out? Uh, so we did that type of study. Uh, this is our before construction. It used to be a Senate lounge, then became uh, temporary legislative offices as we moved about. This is on the fifth floor. Well, what's it covering up? <coughs> it's covering up an original stairwell that was never built. It was always on the drawings, but we never built it. Well, this was probably the most important uh, life safety item we added in the building. We added two grand staircases on the south side to match the north so that people could egress. That's what it ended up looking like. Beautiful. Beautiful. And we just did all kinds of refurbishing and restoration. And the State Library, like I said, talked about how bad it was. When I take people in there, I say, look at the green stripe at the top, then come down to the gold, then come down to the brown, and then look down below that. And do you see the face and the headdress? Because it's Polynesia. I ask them to look at the ceiling, and what appears to me is it looks like a pineapple which is welcoming. Now, Poly uh, Polynesian influence in the State Library had no idea where that came from, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting. At the bottom of this, above the wood wainscot, the wainscot, you see the bird with the berries? That is not a Jayhawk. <laughs> and I can assure you, because I went to a state school a little west of here, not a Jayhawk. <laughs> but again, it's this Polynesian theme. It's just wonderful. The exterior renovation, oh, we spent a lot of time with that. We had to put scaffolding up, touch every stone to find out what was bad and what was good. The stones were falling off. These blocks on the lower right are dentals, they're called, and some of those are missing. But we had uh, cottonwood fall off in our hands that we needed to replace. See the dental that's missing? Tapped on that and it fell right off in his hand. We had another one we found on the ground. They weigh about 15 to 20 pounds and it was over an entrance way to the west <laughs> wing. Yep. So drawings for every stone. Uh, they did 3D modeling on how to set up the crane, how to move the scaffolding from one side to another. This shows you really the finesse that was needed to hand carve the stones when they were placed back in. And the artisans and the craftsmen, they're here. Most of the hand carving was done by Kansans, which was pretty neat. But it also is the brawn that's needed. Besides the finesse, it's the brawn. It's having to pick that stone up and slide it in to the building, because we used a lot of Dutchmen. And the Dutchman is an old means of taking the old stone out, measuring, creating the stone, sliding it in, mooring it in place, and then making sure you can't see it. So if 20 feet away, if you can see the line, then it's not as good as it should be. And that's what you do. This is the 
three photographs from the exact site. So it's fun to go out there and see the quality of the work, see the challenges of the volutes that they had to replace versus <coughs> the existing. We had bird um, metal up there to keep pigeons off so they wouldn't, they wouldn't last. Eh, that wasn't successful. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a, a before shot and an after shot. Not only did we take the biodegradable things off of it, uh, but we repaired the stone. So you're looking at a 30 to 50 year life. Then the copper roof and dome restoration. Well, uh, here's a great shot of, of the roof, and that's the north wing, and it looks really good. And it is, until you stand on it and look at it and see that over the years, the roof moved and the uh, metal attachments that were used and the nails, uh, they rusted through and they penetrated the, the roofing itself. So that in many places, it was held down by friction. This is a Bermuda panel on the dome. And it's a three foot panel and it's about so high, it's made out of copper, where you could grab that panel and lift it and lift the next two or three. It was being held in place by friction and not clips. So these are things that we found, plenty of areas of penetration for, uh, for the water. Uh, oh yes, this is the Capitol store, in case you want to buy a remembrance of our roof and dome, or Capitol jewelry available. And the project took 28 packages to design, bid, and build. Now, you do a modern office building, you do one design package, you go out for bid once and get the low bids. We went out and got low bids 28 different times on 28 different parts of it. So just the amount of drawings, I've got 15,000 drawings mm -hmm. in my office. Uh, looks like that. <laughs> uh, for the project, it's just amazing the amount of work that we went through. But we completed it and we're done. That's the end of my presentation. <laughs>
a much cheaper cost, of course. Well, Ceres was not selected to eventually go up there. She was chosen not to go up there. They had a competition in the Kaw Native uh, Indians up there. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you, you said it's set up so that if there's a fire, you pump in fresh air. Now, on one hand, I think, okay, people will need to breathe fresh air, but the, I think fanning the flames, fire needs oxygen. Wouldn't that just make the fire worse? How do you set that up? Well, because you take the smoke out. You pump the air in, and then we have huge exhaust fans. Uh -huh. uh, on the dome, there's four huge exhaust fans. If there were a real fire, you would see smoke coming out of the windows, uh -huh. four windows in the dome. And so with this volume of air, we get the smoke out. We use the fire protection, the sprinkler system, to control the fire. Okay. So, so the, together. Yeah, the sprinkler system comes on, okay. and it's all area related. So it, it would attack the fire immediately. Yes, sir. Is the new copper expected to turn green, or will it always be brownish? Or the the new copper, just as the old, uh, will turn its final coat of green patina. Uh, however, back at the turn of the century, there was so much sulfur in the air, the coal, the fireplaces, that it probably went from its bright shiny copper, which we've already passed that phase to its current phase, to a dark brown, to the final green patina, which is the final protection for copper. That, that green is what protects the copper uh, in maybe 15 to 17 years. It could take us 40 years, and I told the legislature the entire time, patience, you know, you don't want to try and accelerate that. We tried painting it, putting accelerants on it. It does not work. Nature doesn't like that. So patience is a good thing. Anything else? What's the final final bill for the whole organization? Well, we were appropriated uh, $327 million, um, which is a staggering amount of money. We'll come in about $323 million. Wow. And we're wrapping up the final uh, payments, really, as we speak right now. JADEM will be officially off the project probably in a couple of weeks with their final payments and all. Parking garage and everything in that? Yes, uh, furniture, paint, everything completely. And with that, I need to move on. <laughs> State of Kansas, he has some uh, items he'd like to talk about, a few remarks about uh, the program today. Yes, th thank you very much. Um, I will be brief. I know you've been sitting there for a while. Um, I do have a few slides, though, since we had a projector here. So I'm going to go back. Uh, my name is Matt Beach. I'm a state archivist. That means I uh, am primarily responsible for ensuring that uh, state government records that have permanent value are collected and preserved. And so I've got some stories, uh, just a couple, two stories, quick stories, uh, from, from the archives, although uh, you'll see a lot of the material <coughs> I have up here, they're from the Historical Society's collections, and it's not just state archives. We've got uh, lots of published material in our library, we've got photographs, We've got this beautiful uh, Edward Townsend mixed drawing that's from our museum collection uh, and, and uh, published materials from our library. So I've got a nice collection of things that cover all the different kinds of things that the Historical Society has been collecting in the way of documentary material uh, since our founding in 1875. So my two stories, real, real, I'll, be, I'll be as brief as I can. Although it's, it's taken me about uh, two weeks to uh, boil these two stories down into about ten minutes. So <laughs> uh, we'll see if I can do it. So we're going to go back about 150 years, uh, 149 I think to be exact. Uh, house Bill 34 of 1866 was an act providing for the erection of a state house. We'd just come out of the Civil War. Uh, the, the state offices and state officers were scattered all around Topeka. Uh, there was no official building that was really uh, for, uh, for the state government particularly for the legislature, and so they decided in coming out of the Civil War that they would go ahead and, and move forward and, and, uh, and build a state house, and there was a, uh, an act uh, that was signed on February 14, 1866, 
And that act specifically named as the architect and the designer of the State House this gentleman by the name of Edward Townsend Mix. And he was a, a Milwaukee, Wisconsin uh, architect. And he'd, he'd worked with uh, Cyrus K. Holliday, uh, who was one of the, the founding fathers of, of Topeka. Uh, and he uh, had drawn, he'd, he'd uh, done some drawings um, and, and some plans and some, some specifications. And we happen to have one of his original, uh, original illustrations that's kind of a rendering uh, of, the, of the State House as he perceived it. And so feel free to come up uh, after I'm done here talking and have a look at that. But there were some people who didn't like that, um, that particular design all that well. Um, and, and one of the people who responded to some of those criticisms was a, a gentleman by the name of, of John Gideon Haskell, uh, a Lawrence architect, uh, came out here from Massachusetts during the, the territorial period, uh, hung his shingle out on Massachusetts Street in Lawrence, and uh, became one of our, our more uh, significant architects in the 19th century and, and into the early 20th century here in Kansas. And he and, he and Holiday actually uh, started uh, corresponding with each other uh, about this particular design. And there's a really interesting letter that I have up there. Uh, the, the original is up there. I had it scanned in so you could, could have a, a brief look at it. But um, on uh, February 4th, 1866, Haskell wrote to Holiday. And if we go back here and we look at this, we see that the, the act was actually signed on February 14th, 1866. So this is a little bit before that, 10 days before that. And so Haskell is hard at work drawing up his own set of plans to try and address some of the concerns that people had voiced about the mix plan. Uh, and some of those concerns related to, you can look at that, do I have the mix plan? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'll go a little, a little out of order. Here's that mix plan, you can see it up there. And you can see these uh, answer growths. <coughs> Kind of, kind of faded out there. Um, I am no architectural historian, but I believe that's kind of uh, French Second Empire in style. And so there were some people who, who, were, who were kind of critical of this mix of kind of a neoclassical style and this French Second Empire style. And there were even some, um, there were even some comments in the newspaper, uh, the, the newspapers of the day, that were kind of almost Francophobish. You know, they were, they were like, we, they didn't like the French too much. Fries. Yeah, yeah we've, we've gone through periods of loving and hating the French. And uh, 1866 apparently was a time when they were uh, n not in, in high esteem. I don't know exactly why I did a little poking around. Uh, that was also that was a time when the French under Napoleon III uh, were involved in some activities in Mexico and trying to uh, kind of exert some control and some force in Mexico. So that could have been a reason uh, why we weren't re real fond of the French. So I'll go back to this letter. This letter uh, Haskell is writing. He's again he's feverishly at work on a plan. He says he's nearly completed a new plan for the capital, which he feels. Uh, which he feels will uh, cover the requirements of this case, which means the, the criticisms of the, of the mix plan. Uh, he's going to make it a little bigger, um, both in uh, height, width, uh, and length. Uh, he's, he's still going to follow the Corinthian order, which he underlined. He was very, uh, very uh, uh, emphatic about that. And this interesting little, little uh, statement here, to finish the interior very plainly at first. Uh, with a view to a more elaborate style when the second wing shall be completed, I should think might be made a strong point in inducing the state to adopt an elaborate exterior. So he's kind of a politician, even in 66. He, you know, he, and he's, he's got this idea in his head that we're going to have this, this really, really uh, ornate capital at some point, but he also knows that in 1866 there's not going to be enough money to do that, but he wants the exterior to match his vision for the interior, ultimately. All right, so what happened? In two weeks, they quickly, the legislature moved fast in 1866. Um, and it, and it, I know, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, sad. I thought the senator was going to be here to listen. Um, but they moved really quickly, and they amended their, their initial act uh, in a way which they, they had already seen the Haskell design, and they, they knew that the mixed design wasn't uh, really exactly what they wanted, and so they authorized this thing called the Board of State House Commissioners to make modifications to, to mix his plans, although they did have the caveat that they were not supposed to make changes to the general design, the size, or the overall cost. Uh, and that was passed on February 26th, uh, so, so um, like two weeks later, 14 days after the original act. 
All right, so there's that original design that we have already looked at. There's a kind of a, a one view. Of the, the, keep in mind that they had to do this in phases, um, as Barry indicated earlier. So they they were very clear that they didn't need uh, all uh, you know all wings of the state house. They knew they didn't need um, more than just the east wing, and so they really wanted to, to see what it was going to look like with just the east wing. They were really, really not fond. The legislators were really not fond of that crazy shed. Can you see that shed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was supposed to be some sort of temporary shed. I don't know if you know what it was supposed to be used for, but they hated that. So they, so Haskell certainly got rid of that, but he also changed the design uh, significantly overall. I would say that he actually changed the general design, but that's just me speaking because it looks a little different. <laughs> All right, we, we hop forward about 20 years, and uh, John G. Haskell is still on the scene. Um, and, and in 1885, there was a need to do some repair and remodeling of the East Wing. Um, in 1881, the West Wing was completed. It had a beautiful house chamber, and the Senate was left with the old chamber in the east wing that had been divided for use of both houses of the legislature and it was in not the best shape it had been used pretty hard and so you'll see this i called out this one little section of the law that um, authorized the uh, repair and remodel of the east wing and it says that the sum of seventy five thousand dollars and this is important for the, the rest of my story here that the sum of seventy five thousand dollars is hereby appropriated out of the general revenue fund of the state for the purpose of immediately commencing and completing the work upon the east wing of the capital and those two words are are, are important I, I, the, the highlighting or the uh, the emphasis is mine uh, but there's some it ultimately becomes very important to to debate whether the immediate was more, uh, was more important than the completing. Those two words were competing with each other, and it all revolves around the, the sum of $75,000. Well, they spent, you'll see over here, um, they, they appropriated 75, they spent over 120. I had my wife calculate that earlier, that is a 60% overrun. <laughs> all right, that's, that's a lot. Uh, it's also interesting to note that $75,000 in 1885 is the equivalent of about $1.8 million in 2013 dollars, according to the website that I found this morning. <laughs> so take that or leave it. But that's, that's about right, I think, based on the, on the consumer price index uh, uh, changes over time. So they've got a 60% cost overrun. How did they get there? Well, I've, uh, in the state archives, we've got uh, we've got all of these bills. Basically, they're not bills. They were these were this is a, a list of the accounts that they approved. The board of state house of commissioners had to approve all of the accounts uh, or all all of the invoices. And so I've just highlighted a few here uh, on the left. You'll it's hard to read some of that. There's something about copper leaf. There's something about uh, this thing called modillions, which is a word that I just learned um, in my carpool on Friday. Since I carpool with the deputy state historic preservation officer, um, um, a modillion is uh, one of those little brackety things that kind of comes out. Uh, I've got them in my house. I'll just, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Patrick, Patrick Zolder, he knows all about them. Uh, but they were expensive. They spent like $2,100 on modillions. And then if you look at the right side over there, they spent, eight, well, they got, they got a nice 10% discount, but they spent $18,315 on marble and onyx. All right, so it's, I mean, it was expensive. The stuff was expensive. They only had seventy-five thousand dollars total. They spent eighteen thousand on the marble and onyx. All right. So there's another <clears throat> another player involved. The the president of the board of state house commissioners was a, was a gentleman by the name of E. T. Carr, uh, Erasmus Theodore. That was his name. He went by E. T. Or E. T. C. Which means etc. Um, uh, <laughs> So very interestingly, uh, and you will, you will see that there's a joint committee. Ultimately, there's, a, there's an investigation. All right, the, the, the legislators are not happy. The public is not happy that they went 60% over budget. So there's this joint committee on state affairs that, does a re, that uh, issues a report. And they take 100 pages. There's like 100 pages of testimony in this report. And that report is, is, is sitting right up here. The interesting thing about this particular version of the report is that it is annotated by Erasmus Theodore Carr himself. All right, little pencils, and he's oh, he's mad. 
you can you can you can read. It's really really entertaining reading, uh, and it's in our library, and it's actually in a in a very safe place in our library. It's in our cage, and we protect it. Um, I'm going to scan this whole thing and get it up online because it's really great. But here are a couple quotes from it. So he, he's, he's basically trying to explain uh, to whoever is going to read this, I guess us, that, um, that there was a good reason for doing the Senate chamber in such an ornate manner. That's really what drove the costs up. And he said that nearly every member that I talked with seemed to want the best or most expensive one, whatever it might be, and he said they wanted to eat the house. <laughs> <laughs> and he also said, this is, I don't know who Smith of Marshall was. Uh, I could have looked him up, but I kind of ran out of time. Smith of Marshall said, give us a fine room, and we will stand by you. <laughs> Be careful. Which, yeah, it, yeah, they, they did not. They, they, threw, they threw Mr. Carr, and they threw Mr. Haskell, um, and, and Mr. Haskell, uh, Dundee Haskell, was the architect um, on this particular project. They threw them both under the bus. <laughs> All right, a lot of text here. The essence of this is that they said that uh, the, the Board of State House Commissioners and the architects knew full well that $75,000 was the upper limit, that they'd gone more than $40,000 over budget. They were not happy. They said that the, the, the Board of State House Commissioners had allowed the architects to run, uh, <clears throat> to run it without let or hindrance, that they just went wild, and that the architects themselves <coughs> were able advocates of the adoption of the plans that they well knew would require an expenditure far beyond the amount appropriated, and they recommended that the present Board of State House Commissioners, the State Architect, and Assistant Architect be at once removed from office. Wow. Our national government should learn from that. <laughs> they did leave office. Um, they did leave office. Uh, but not without uh, some, some final comments from, from Mr. Carr himself. This is the, the kind of the last page in that uh, report that he annotated. And he said, so far as my testimony is concerned, it seems the most stupid and incorrect I have known, whether from accident, incompetency, or determined perversion, I can't say. <laughs> I was not very happy. It is interesting to note that, uh, in particular, John Gideon Haskell, he did resign. But he waited at least a few weeks. He, he waited a, a, close to a month uh, from what I was been able to determine so that he could ensure that the Senate chamber was finished to his specifications. <laughs> Finally, the Joint Committee also decided they would become architecture critics. In their <laughs> and so they, uh, they included this, this gem. Um, and they said that and while there are many beautiful things about the interior decoration of the Senate chamber, Yet it seems as if the aim had been to throw together as many different kinds of material, many of them very beautiful, as could be found. Four or five varieties of marble, onyx, iron, bronze, copper, oxidized silver, polished brass, mahogany, <laughs> plaster, etc., in a sort of crazy quilt style that while from its novelty it may please for some time, yet is lacking in that repose and character <laughs> that should be found in a room designed for the purpose for which this is intended. <laughs> You be the judge <laughs> of that statement. And that's my hope. Those are my two stories. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you, uh, Matt Beach State Archivist. Uh, Matt's been out here on several occasions. Last year, when Chief Justice uh, Supreme Court uh, Lawton Ness was here, and he had always had some great things to share with the audience. And before that, the first time with uh, Secretary of State Kobach. So it's always a pleasure to have Matt Beach, the State Archivist for the State Historical Society out here. And um, I would like to present to our speaker, Barry Grice, a certificate of appreciation for coming out and doing an excellent job. <laughs> like a uh, copy of this book on the State House History Restoration, it's downstairs. And I also want to recognize uh, Craig Dannenberg uh, with the IT Department of Historical Society. And also Matt Beach back there too with the IT State Historical Society. I'm, I'm Matt Beach, that's Matt oh, Powell. Matt Powell, excuse me. <laughs> And uh, last but not least, I better recognize my boss, too, 
and that's Patrick Zollner back there. He's the deputy uh, PIPO of the State Historical Society, also director of the Preservation Department and State Historic Sites for the Kansas State Historical Society, uh, Patrick Zollner. And next week, uh, we'll uh, be talking about the Alexander Gardner photographs. Uh, we have an oversized one back there on the wall. And uh, we still happen today to have uh, uh, the presenter here, and uh, that's John Charlton right there, who will be coming out to talk about his book that he co-authored with Dr. Jim Shiro at K-State. And I believe Dr. Shiro may be here uh, next oh, Sunday. Oh. Very good. <laughs> so they'll be talking about the Alexander Gardner uh, uh, photographs. We also will have uh, Nancy Sherbert, who is the curator of pho uh, photographs at the Kansas State Historical Society. will be joining uh, John and uh, Dr. Schroeder to talk about Alexander Gardner. Thank you all for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your patronage, your support in this program series. It's very much appreciated. And uh, please uh, uh, visit our other museum, the uh, Territorial Capital Lane Museum. And uh, we've got some fine shops down the street uh, and a really nice uh, little restaurant. So if you're planning to come out uh, next Sunday, uh, why not have lunch at Aunt Netter's or Kroger's if they're open? And uh, spend the day in historic Lecompton. Thank you very much. <laughs>